now recording. And Peter, if you would activate your screen, uh, you can take over. And we see you there, Peter. You and Jack, you, uh, you can end your presentation if you would uh, want to uh, close that. For Jack Dunnigan, if you would, uh, uh, you can close I your just, screen. I just figured out how to turn it on and now I can't turn it off. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Very good. Uh, and I, I will mute mine, Peter. Thank you. All right. What can you see of me right now? I can see your whole, uh, whole head. And, yeah. uh, but I can't seem to get the screen. There we go. Hang on. Okay. There we go. There you go. All You're right. good. All right. Well, thank you. Um, I'm Peter Plum up here in Portland, Maine. I was hoping to be in St. Augustine, Florida with you all. Uh, now, I, I appreciated the opportunity to do a presentation to you uh, last February in, uh, uh, in St. Pete. Um, this is the story of a trip I took on my own boat uh, in 2009, starting in Portland, Maine, and circumnavigating New Newfoundland back to Portland. Uh, it was an 11-week trip, uh, 3,000 miles. So... Um, does, is this working now, Ed? Is everybody seeing yes. what I see? You're doing good. It's, it's showing uh, your boat, beautiful okay. boat, and your, your grade. All right, very I'll good. I'll stop my video and, and go ahead. All right, thank you. Well, here's, here's the boat. Uh, this is Sparkman Stevens' design, uh, Seguin class sloop, uh, 46 feet long. She was built by Lyman Morse in Thomaston, Maine back in 1984. So she's, she's got a few miles on her now. Um, it has the advantage of being a centerboard, a keel centerboard boat. So uh, I can get into some pretty shoal places where others can't at, at about five and a half feet. Uh, she draws 10 feet with the board down. Uh, we do have a diesel S-bar hot air heater, which makes a world of difference in these northern trips. And we do have a small generator, which powers, among other things, a, a good refrigeration and freezer system. So we can be independent for quite a while. Here's the trip, um, starting in Portland, bouncing away up the coast of uh, Nova Scotia, which we did very quickly. I had to sit out a gale here in Canso for a couple of days, then up through the Broadoor Lakes to Badek, where I had my first crew change. And then the first stop in Newfoundland was up at um, uh, the uh, Bay of Islands. Uh, there are very, very few stops on the west coast of Newfoundland that are safe uh, for sailboats or boats generally. Uh, the next stop up here, bounced up here, then went up to Red Bay in Labrador. And by now it's just coming on the 4th of July. We came back here to sit out another uh, two day gale and back around to St. Anthony. I'll, I'll return to this uh, map as we go along. A couple of words about Newfoundland uh, for those who may have not been there before. It's a, one of the world's largest islands uh, its dimensions are roughly 350, 400 miles each side. It was first seen by Europeans, so far as we know, by John Cabot in 1497. And there wasn't much going on there. Um, and the place bounced back and forth between the British and the French. It became a dominion for a while. Um, always the only thing really going on there was, was cod fishing, which uh, collapsed. Uh, in the 1960s and finally totally in the 1990s. In 1949, the people of Newfoundland voted to join Canada. And so it became the province of Newfoundland. A few years later, um, Canada added on the huge area of Lab Labrador. Um, but Labrador, uh, so it's now the province of Newfoundland and Lab Labrador. Newfoundland uh, now has about 500,000 people in it, more than half of whom live within 30 miles of the capital, St. John's. Um, in the last decade, the last uh, 50, 60 years, the government forcibly uh, abandoned, made people abandon a lot of towns along here and in here as the cod fishery collapsed 
uh, and the government said, we're just not gonna uh, provide services to you because many of these places are available only by water. There was a huge out migration in the last 50 years of men going to work, uh, unemployed men going to work in the tar sands, oil production in, uh, in uh, British Columbia and Ontario. That's starting to change. And in the 1990s, there was a huge discovery of oil and gas deposits out here. So that today, St. John's is a very, very bustling town. Some call it the Kuwait of the North. So here we go. Many of you have had this uh, issue um, of finding crew to do a cruise like this. Uh, not a lot of people uh, are willing to take 11 weeks off. So I went through 13 crew on this trip. Um, all of whom were very glad to be part of it, many of whom uh, spent a lot of time and energy and resources to find me and then leave me. This is the first crew and we're headed out. Uh, that's Portland Head Light, uh, leaving Portland Harbor. Those of you who've sailed across the Gulf of Maine as I've done many times now, uh, know that it can be a kind of an unpleasant place to be, but this is what every sailor hopes for, a nice peaceful night and a beautiful sunset. Um, I mentioned that we weathered out a, a, a pretty big gale in a little marina at a place called Canso. And then you, to get into uh, the Badek, you go to the, through the St. Peter's Locks into the Brador Lakes in Cap, Cape Breton. And there I had my first crew change. This is the St. Peter's Locks right here. Um, and then it's about a 30 hour ride up to Newfoundland, the Bay of Islands. Uh, and it was uh, clearing off outside when we got there. It was kind of foggy on the inside. Uh, this is a fairly big area that you can poke around in. Uh, we didn't go all the way down into it. Um, we were tired and it was about a 30 hour ride. So uh, we found a place to, in fact, a nice mooring, uh, walked around the shore a little bit and had a good night's sleep. Heading on north, um, you can see it's a little chilly. Uh, this is now the third week in June. We left uh, June 16 from Portland. Uh, and the next stop up is Bun Bay. This is the home of Gros Morne National Park. Gros Morne, which is the red uh, mountain sort of thing you see there, is the largest mountain in Newfoundland. And we wanted to have a look at it closer up. We anchored in a little place called Nettie's Harbor. And I'd read in the cruising guide that there was a pretty good mooring there that was available for folks like me to pick up. So I picked it up. And then we went ashore and started walking around a little bit. I found a bunch of guys in a, in a fishing shack um, having their uh, afternoon moonshine and, and, and beer. Uh, and I asked one of them if uh, I was on the, uh, a safe mooring. And he said, oh yeah, that's a great mooring. I just sold it last week for a six pack of beer. It's a great mooring. So uh, uh, we had a fine time there, but I was also walk walking around town and, and a little, little tiny town. Um, and there was a big lilac bush in full, full bloom and a lady sitting on her front porch in the yard there. I asked her if I could pick a couple of sprigs of lilac and take back to the boat and make the cabin smell nice. She asked me if I was off that pretty green boat with the American flag and I said, yes. And she said, well then take the whole bush. And this was our real first encounter with the Newfoundlanders who were just the most wonderful people you will ever hope to meet. They are helpful, friendly, give you the shirt off the back. That translates into giving you the keys to their car for a while in many cases. We did climb Gross Morn, a um, little hard scrabble there. The, uh, the flora and the fauna is, is very interesting. It's sort of subarctic uh, at this point. Um, you could put your foot in some of the mossy places and go down a, a, a foot or a foot and a half. Still some snow around. So then we headed up and our next stop was a, a fishing port called Port Saunders. And you see here um, this big dock with a yellow railing. That exists in almost every Canadian fishing village, um, courtesy of the Canadian gov government supporting its maritime industry. These are strong, uh, good docks to lay alongside. You do need fender boards uh, uh, so you don't scrape your, uh, your boat up. Um, most of these have power, so you can plug in. 
and some like this one around the corner and behind um, have water. <clears throat> this was the end of the capelin season. Cap capelin are little small fish, kind of like herring. Um, and while most of the boats are still up, uh, are on the hard, uh, a few go out uh, to fish for the, cap the capelin uh, as part of their overall uh, activities. This is looking back from the boat to the town. This is a very typical Newfoundland town. They are uh, well kept. Um, most of these are shrinking and dying, however. Um, most of these have lost their schools. Um, the younger families have moved away and there's a few fish, fishing families left. Fort Saunders seemed to be holding its own. Next stop up is a place called Port Ochoa, C-H-O-I-X, Port of Choice. Um, we're parked over there on one of the uh, government docks and there's another one here. Um, a little more fishing going on here. Uh, the Coast Guard was in evidence. <coughs> Excuse me. We, um, had a, our first dinner ashore here in a little restaurant that served some nice fish. Um, and they served us the favorite Newfoundland dessert called figgy duff. And figgy duff is a kind of a, a gingerbread-y kind of thing, sticky, gooey, and it sits in your stomach. It's very sweet. Uh, sits in your stomach like a rock. So we uh, um, hiked around. They had a nature, nature preserve hike here um, with some interesting things. Um, you can see that spring is, is in full flower here. Our next stop up was Flowers Cove. We're getting quite a ways up now to the northern tip. Um, but it was a thick fog and uh, raining, and I couldn't get any really good pictures for you. So the following day, we headed across the Straits of Belle Isle to Labrador. Our destination was Red Bay, about 40 miles away. Um, as we neared uh, Red Bay, uh, this fellow loomed right out at us, um, our first really decent sized iceberg. This time of year, uh, June and sometimes early July, this place is known as Iceberg Alley. Um, the uh, Greenland glaciers calve off and the Labrador current brings these icebergs down where about half of them go down the Straits of Belle Isle and the other half go down the east coast of Newfoundland. Um, you can get a sense of the size of this. This is all seabirds along here. Uh, you know, I, I, I think that roughly 85 to 90 percent of any iceberg is below the surface. Um, you don't want to get too close to these. They break apart. They roll over. Um, they make a lot of noise. When you get closer to them, you can hear them hissing and crackling and shards of ice flying off all the time. This is Red Bay in Labrador. Um, Red Bay is a, is a beautiful, one of the nicest harbors you could ever be in. We're parked over here on the government dock. You see there's no other boats here at all. Today or back in time of this trip, Red Bay had 200 people living there. It was a little museum. The government had run electrical power up there, uh, but it was, it was clearly a struggling place. In the 15, late 1500s and into the 1600s, and maybe a little beyond, Red Bay was the whaling center for the Basques and some other Europeans. There were, by some accounts, over a thousand people here in the summertime working the fishing and also the cod, the whaling and also the cod fishing industry. I read an account of the first um, maritime insurance claim that was ever paid off for a boat that sank in the New World. It was in 1586 and a Basque boat sank here and filed a claim with the issuer of the policy, which happened to be the Vatican, then located in Barcelona, Spain, and they paid the claim. You can see that these are, these are tidy towns. They're well kept. Um, people are extremely friendly. But there's also an air about, you know, well, this time has come, come and gone also. Right outside the harbor was a fairly large iceberg that had grounded. Um, and one of my crew insisted uh, that we launch the dinghy and, and uh, go out and, and touch it. So we had to do that. Um, this was the first of se several things like this. 
This is the coast of uh, Red Bay, looking back across the Straits of Belle Isle at Newfoundland. We're headed, uh, looking basically south, southeast here. You can see the whole parade of these things. You hear them breaking apart, and rolling over all the time, all night long. I had hoped to get further up the coast of Labrador, um, but, uh, and it was now July 3. Um, and we got uh, weather warnings from the Canadian Weather Service, which is very good. They do a lot of broadcasts and they really are very thorough. Um, that we had a two day Northeast gale coming. Um, and so discretion being the better part of valor, we headed back across the Straits of Belle Isle. I show you this picture just to give you a sense of what uh, the temperature is like. The water temperature is about 40 to 42. So if you sail up here, you need to be pretty well uh, um, buttoned up with some good warm clothes. We went to uh, the little tiny town of Raleigh, uh, where we tied up against the town dock. This picture was taken from the, from the shore. Um, I felt that as time went on, I should have pulled us in a little bit further, but we were safe and sound here. Um, and we had electric power, so uh, we did all right. It was a two-day gale, but it did give us an opportunity to explore the area. You can just see um, in the corner there the fender board, which is outside the bumpers there. You do need these uh, big heavy-duty fender boards to uh, keep the boat uh, safe. Gave us an opportunity to explore. Uh, a kindly person loaned us his car. And we drove over to Anso Meadow, which is the uh, reconstructed, as best they can figure it out, uh, Viking site that was found quite a few years ago. There's a big museum here and a tourist center and lots of tour buses show up. Um, it's very interesting. The weather was terrible, um, cold and rainy and windy. But they have rebuilt these uh, places as best they, they, they think they were. This is cod drying racks. I have often wondered, um, looking at this picture, why the Vikings chose this site. It's exposed, it's a rocky uh, beach and rocks there, uh, when you'll see in a minute, just around the corner, there is a, uh, a, a very beautiful, uh, quiet harbor that they could go and, and do, do uh, have, have a nice quiet settlement. But that's the way it was. This is Edmund and Millison. They lived in the house right at the head of the dock in Raleigh and befriended us early on. Uh, we used their showers, they gave us their car. Um, what she has in her hand there is a, uh, what are called bake apples. It's a, a peculiar Newfoundland uh, berry kind of thing. It's quite tart. Um, and the two traditional Newfoundland dishes are bake apple pie and bake apple cheesecake. So we invited them um, aboard for dinner uh, during the midst of this gale uh, and had a, a wonderful evening. He's a retired long line fisherman. Um, she is the mother of four, uh, raised her kids. Their kids who have now all gone, very few people left in the community. The, um, the school is shut down and they're just living out their lives here knowing that uh, there's probably not a big future for anybody there, but they were the most lovely people. When we left the next day, um, she stood on the end of the dock screaming at us, we love you, we love you, come back. This is Cape Bald, the northern tip of Newfoundland, and you can see now we're headed down the east coast of that peninsula there. You can see the icebergs going down this way also. And that little town that I talked about where I thought the Vikings should have gone is this place called Cricket. It was one of the towns that was forcibly abandoned, uh, but in the last few years, it's become a summer community again with uh, doctors and lawyers and whatnot uh, coming up from St. John's and elsewhere to uh, uh, build and renovate uh, summer homes. It's a beautiful, idyllic um, place and a great place to spend a vacation. We're headed down the coast of St. Anthony um, and we saw this fairly large iceberg out there. So we went out to have a little closer look. And as we, as we got there, uh, this whole hunk fell off of here with a great crashing and banging and roaring and uh, water flying all around. And uh, so we watched that. And just as we were standing or sitting there on the boat giving uh, a reasonable berth to it, the whole thing began to roll over. 
Um, and I realized that I perhaps got myself a little too close there, um, but uh, it quietly, well, I shouldn't say quietly because they make a lot of noise, but it, it, it rolled over. And then we made a tour around it to see what it looked like uh, in its new configuration. This is St. Anthony. Um, it's the largest town in, uh, by far in Northern Newfoundland. It has a stoplight, which is amazing. This whole complex here um, is the Grenfell Mission, which is the medical facilities uh, serving all of nor northern Newfoundland and much of Lab Labrador. They still, have, um, they still have boats that go out and service the, uh, the small towns along the coast. Uh, once again, we're parked over here. At the, uh, that was a Coast Guard dock, which they let us stay at. for. A, um, you, this is a good place to have a crew change. I had a crew change here. Um, and uh, good provisioning and so you need to spend a little time there. Here we are at St. Anthony and we're going down this peninsula. Um, we cut off and went over here over into um, the beginning of Notre Dame Bay which is the prime cruising ground and then into Lewisport which was the halfway mark of the trip uh, and uh, there I left the boat for a week and flew home from Gander, uh, which is an hour taxi drive away, uh, to be with my grandchildren for a week. Iceberg, right outside of St. Anthony, and because this was such a, it, it too was a grounded one. It had such a wonderful uh, uh, configuration that we spent a little time watching it. Um, new crew had to pat it, of course, um, and to get a piece of it. Uh, icebergs, as you know, are fresh water and you collect these uh, little pieces in the water or chip it off an iceberg um, and it's called Brigy Bits and it makes for wonderful uh, ice cubes in your various libations. They snap, crackle and pop. And the skipper had to have that picture taken just to show that we were actually there. We'd been uh, recommended to stop in a place a few miles south of St. Anthony called Maiden Arm. Um, this place reminded me more of Maine than, than anywhere else in, in uh, Newfoundland. And one of the things they mentioned to us was that the water was quite a bit warmer here than the 40 to 42 degrees outside. And lo and behold, the water was just about 60. And so everybody had to uh, have at it. <laughs> and then of course, you get your burgie bits. This is the little fishing port of, uh, called Conchi. Um, the last town down the road, you can't go any further south on the peninsula by car. Uh, you can see we're nestled up in here against a, a quite a bit bigger boat. This was the end of the snow crab season here and their snow crab uh, processing facility was in full swing. Uh, they gave us a whole bunch of snow crabs. Um, snow crabs are a little smaller than Alaskan king crabs, but they are tasty and wonderful and whatnot. They're, they're just a wonderful uh, meal of those. Little tourist place, we had a nice little dinner here. And then when we went back to the boat for the night, and we were just settling down and I heard a big thump on the deck. I went up to have a look and there was the skipper of the boat we were uh, uh, moored against. He showed us all over his boat, very proud of it and whatnot. And he tossed down a whole big bunch of salmon. And I looked up at it and he waved and said, have a good trip and off he went. Icebergs and wonderful configurations. Um, this one had probably rolled um, and come up in a different way. And now we're down um, at a little town, one of the ones that the government forcibly abandoned called Forshi. Um, all that's left really is the cemetery. We came in here because this was the town that serviced the last whaling station in Newfoundland, which is up the fjord a little bit. Um, it actually had operated until 1972, but today uh, it is really a, a, a bunch of rusting, rusting tanks and cauldrons and uh, all kinds of, of, of stuff. It was a very sad, morose uh, kind of place, so we uh, moved on. This is uh, taking a hike outside the little town of Stocking. Um, and we, the, the town dock looked like many others and people came and as they always do and told us about some wonderful hiking they had. And so we tried that. 
um, the, the, um, as we entered their harbor, uh, we of course had seen lots of whales and seals and all kinds of sea life, uh, but a humpback whale came up alongside not more than 10 feet from us and blew. And I don't know if you've ever had that experience, but getting drenched by uh, the spout of a whale is about as gross as it gets. The stuff stinks to holy heaven. Another little town, probably mostly a summer community, um, probably not available other than by water. This um, was a little place um, that had been recommended to us. Um, and uh, this is outside the town of Stocking. You can see I'm, I'm anchored uh, bow and stern because there wasn't enough room to swing freely. Little town up here had been abandoned years ago. And we went ashore and looked around. And then uh, as we were finishing up dinner, uh, this fellow shows up in his outboard he just wanted to talk um, and uh, we talked to him about his life. He was about 40 years old and he and his wife had a 40 foot uh, fishing boat that uh, they ran together. We asked him, you know, what, he, what could he fish for? And he said, anything the government lets me catch, uh, which could range from shrimp to crab uh, to capelin, um, no cod yet. He can't catch cod, uh, at least back then. Um, he said he did, he did okay with it. He had two, two kids, an 18 year old son who was just getting out of high school who said he was gonna join, on the, was gonna join him on the boat um, and a 15 year old daughter who was very anxious to leave and go away to college as fast as she could. Uh, he said he put a couple of moose in his uh, freezer every year to tide him over. And towards the end of the winter into the early spring when this part of Newfoundland has, still has a seal hunt uh, he would he would get a, a, a few seals and sell their pelts. He said that's what basically kept them going through the end of the winter into the springtime. We're headed now into um, sometimes called Maine on steroids. Uh, the Notre Dame cruising grounds are full of lots of little islands um, and then down into Lewisport. This is a uh, nice cruising. <laughs> it isn't, you're not banging around or anything. You're, you're just having a nice, um, nice, nice sail from island to island. Doesn't take long to get from one to the next. We love this place. It's called Bay of Islands, Little Bay of Islands. A um, bunch of little islands connected with little bridges. Um, it too had been largely abandoned in the 60s and 70s and 80s, but now is starting to recover. Not much fishing at all, but um, a lot of, of summer folk and some, some tourism. First time I had a chance to uh, get a, a, a cell phone signal in a long, long time to see if everything was okay back home. Quite a lovely bucolic place. This was Roger, he's an American. Uh, at the time he was 76. He'd been widowed for about 10 years and lived in Alabama, I think it was in the winter time, but he had a summer home up here and he raised strawberries. Uh, he was a retired Marine. It might have been a marine general. Um, and he raised strawberries and bought us, brought us a bunch of strawberries. And he talked to us about how he liked to sail. He had a 32 foot, I think it was a Pacific Seacraft double ender. And every few years he'd take off on a nice solo sail for a while. And his choices were the Azores or Iceland, both about 1300 miles away. And he'd sail over and back. These folks have nice sense of humor and decorating their, uh, their boats. Another little inn had a lovely dinner here with some of the local folk. Uh, they asked us to stay for the next two or three days. They were about to start their annual music festival and uh, some of the crew wanted to do that, but the skipper said, no, we're, we're pushing on. Um, another little island here. I show you this picture because um, this is the island of Triton. Um, the Canadian government has done a lot of this in this area anyway. Instead of providing trails through the uh, flora and fauna, they build these very elaborate um, walking boardwalk uh, with steps and all. This one went on for almost five miles. It was a, a, a lovely hike. This was a place that had been recommended to me, a place called God's Pocket. And while you can't see it here, there were waterfalls on both sides uh, burbling down. 
um, all kinds of eagles, um, a lot of marine life. And for the first time since we've really been able to uh, look for them, a whole bunch of mussels. And we had a mussel cook off who could make the best sauce and all that. Just lounging around and enjoying the, uh, the peace and quiet of these little lovely islands. Doing a little work too. And every day you had to figure out where you wanted to go next. This was my personal favorite in this area. It's an island called Exploits. It too had been largely abandoned, uh, but in the 1600s and 1700s and into the 1800s, this was the transit point for a lot of the small fishing uh, schooners, fishing smacks that would fish along the, in the islands here along the coast and up into Lab Labrador. And they'd bring their catch back down here where they'd be transferred to the larger boats that would head off to Europe or south to this, <clears throat> the, the Americas. Now it is increasingly popular among the uh, professional folks and uh, a lot of uh, people want to uh, renovate homes or build new homes as summer places. But there's still a fair amount of this there also. Lewisport, uh, where we are here, is where I left the boat for a week. There's a substantial marina, it has 150 slips, give or take. Good marine services, good shopping, um, and uh, it was a place that I could feel safe in leaving the boat for a little while and going off to see grandkids and coming back. It's also the halfway point of the trip. Now we've run about 1,500 miles. Coming back, leave Lewisport, I took the new crew back to Exploits, just I wanted them to see that, out by Twilling Gate, which is a familiar name to many, Fogo Island, and then you start going around these capes here on your way down the east coast, um, ultimately winding up at St. John's. New crew, uh, this is a surgeon from Johns Hopkins Hospitals in, um, in uh, Baltimore who said he could only spend a week but really wanted to go to Newfoundland. And so I said, here's your chance. That's my sweet wife who uh, joined me now uh, for most of the rest of the trip. Back we go to exploits, um, to see some of the newer homes here that are being um, built up in the area here um, and the ever present graveyard. Some domestic stuff. The hot water heater on, on the boat is in the stern. So when it came time to take a shower and the, and the uh, deck shower was farther quite a ways forward, um, I would be the one that got elected to uh, take the cold shower until the hot water showed up and then my wife could have her warm shower. This is Twilling Gate. Um, there's lots of songs written about Twilling Gate. Um, lovely um, fishing port, a pretty substantial fishing port, and also now uh, the beneficiary of a fair amount of tourism. This fellow, the gray haired fellow, is uh, the harbor master. He had been a fisherman, but now he's a harbor master. Um, behind him, you can't see it, uh, was a, a shrimp processing plant running at full steam and disgorging the most god awful stuff into the harbor. But he took us on, under his wing, drove us all around, showed us um, out of town the beautiful lighthouse out at the head of the Cape there. Um, and uh, quite, a, quite a lovely uh, uh, scenery. From him, we learned about two special Newfoundland recipes and Julia uh, Childs would have loved this. Uh, the first one, he says, you will never see on a restaurant menu in Newfoundland because it's not politically correct, called seal flipper pie. He says, every Newfoundlander knows how to make this and loves it. He says, you, you take two seal flippers and put them in a big uh, dish, a baking dish, add all the vegetables and potatoes and everything else you want, and then put a nice layer of pasty, pastry dough over the whole thing, and then you bake it. And he said, it is the most delicious dish you will ever have in your whole life. The other one he talked about was, uh, it sounds like Thanksgiving, he says you take a murre, M-U-R-R-E, which is a fairly big, big black bird. Its cousin, the, uh, I, I'm sorry, you take the tur, who is a first cousin to a murr, um, uh, murs are protected, turs are not. I'm not sure what the difference is. Anyway, you get one of those and get it ready to go uh, to bake, and then you stuff a puffin in it, and then you bake them both together. 
And that makes a wonderful, wonderful Newfoundland meal also. This is Fogo Island, <clears throat> another one of our favorites. Fogo, um, like so many others, uh, basically crashed in the 60s. There was a few small towns that weren't connected by roads. The cod fishery was done. Everyone was unemployed. Uh, the government said, you all got to leave. And the Fogo Islanders said, oh no, not so fast. Um, we're going to figure this out. And they went through a thing called the Fogo process. And the result of that was the government loaned them some money to build roads to connect the towns, uh, loaned them enough money to uh, build a complete new fishing fleet, much more versatile fishing fleet. Um, and it worked. And today, uh, while much of the fishing fleet and the uh, processing plants are owned in common, uh, Fogo is a prosperous place um, by almost any standard. And there, in the summertime, there are car ferries, which now go back and forth multiple times a day back to um, uh, Lewisport. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a turnaround story. We, we parked uh, here at the Marine, um, uh, sort of the Marine Museum. And the lady on the left in the shorts uh, is the curator and caretaker of the place. And the girl uh, beside me is, is her daughter who was headed off uh, excitedly to Halifax for, uh, for college, uh, but she saw her future here as a teacher. She thought it would be a wonderful place to uh, live and raise a family. We wanted to take a drive around the island and I asked the lady where I might find a car and she said, here are the keys. She gave me her car and said, just, just uh, have a nice, nice ride. So we did. Um, this parade procession of little boats here had just come in from an annual um, two, -man did, two men per boat race, uh, rowing race to an island 10 miles away and back. And apparently it's accompanied with much hilarity and all kinds of festivities. Uh, there are the boats. We're sorry we didn't see the race. Here are the Fogo Islanders and a bunch of tourists like us um, at play on a beach. Hard to imagine that this is Newfoundland, Northeast Newfoundland, um, and the water is swimmable. I mean, it's just like Maine. Um, and my surgeon friend had sworn he wouldn't get in, but you know, guess what he did? And my sweet wife did also. These are government workers um, unloading a batch of cod that had been caught for government purposes. The government and back then was trying to figure out how much the inshore cod fishery was coming back because it was. And by now, uh, when we were there, uh, they would let every family with a boat, a uh, little boat, go out and catch five cod per day for their own use. Couldn't sell it, you couldn't do any, any, anything with it except have it for your own use. Um, I think the cod fishery has improved since then somewhat, um, but here they were just on the cusp of figuring out what was really going to happen. The result for us was that we got cod up the wazoo all the time. You want some cod? Here, let me give you some cod. You want your cod filleted? Let me fillet it for you. Uh, we had more cod than I ever thought I'd eat in my whole life. Now we're back on the mainland, a place called Green's Pond. Um, for those of you who like to go berrying, <clears throat> this part of the world uh, is one of the most astounding berry places I've ever seen with blueberries and blackberries and raspberries and huckleberries and you name it, they have it in great quantities. I had a crew change here. Um, I, I, I had to go visit this place because I've been a lawyer all of my professional life. Um, and um, so this is one of the must-see stops, the little Greenspawn Historic Courthouse. This is uh, next crew, uh, my law partner for the last 50 years and childhood friend, uh, Peter Murray who also built his own schooner. We've done a lot of sailing together. This is typical of the little coves that you can crawl into as you work your way back towards St. John's. Uh, what distinguishes this place, it, it, it's beautiful of course, but the mosquitoes were as fierce as I've ever been anywhere in my whole life. And it was just like you were gonna get eaten alive if you didn't beat them off and you prayed for a lot of wind. Here we're coming into the town of Trinity. Um, Trinity was destined to become the capital of Newfoundland. It was the busy, uh, biggest and busiest fishing port uh, for uh, many years, and then it too died. 
And today it has a, a small year round population of about 50, which grows to several hundred uh, in the summertime because people have rediscovered it. Uh, it's a historic site. A lot of historic business buildings have been restored. Um, not, not any fishing going on here, but uh, uh, a lovely place to come visit. A um, bunch of Americans here. This house was owned by a, a retired member of the US Foreign Service. And when we got there, they took us under their wing and we had a very full dance card for uh, the 48 hours or so we spent here um, having a wonderful time. This is beautiful old Ang Anglican church, well-maintained. Um, I, uh, I actually started my life as an organist. And when I saw this beautiful little organ there, I asked if I could play it. It had been shipped over from England uh, in the turn of the uh, 20th century um, and was still in good playing condition. The only thing about it was it didn't have an electric blower. So there's the mayor of Trinity pumping away uh, while I wailed away on the organ. The, uh, I, I think I went through seven or eight guys before I they say, said that's enough. The gentleman here um, it, at this point was 80, a little over 80 years old and had built over a thousand boats in his lifetime here. He is working on a um, about a 40 foot schooner. The thing that surprised me about this is a look, look at the scantlings on this boat. It's very, very light. Um, so it's really destined for use just around in the, in the local area there. Uh, my partner, Peter Murray had, had built his own wooden schooner. So these two hit it off like peas in a pod. Trinity boasts what uh, is advertised as one of the most, one of the 20 most beautiful trails in North America. They have, it's a trail that you can do in about three hours. Um, it is absolutely gorgeous. Um, some spectacular vistas um, that you can see. Moving along, um, this is for uh, the folks that I had talked to that have been there before. This is the holy grail of cruising sailors coming up from uh, the States uh, and Nova Scotia. This is a place called Ireland's Eye. Like many other places, it had a little town that had been forcibly evacuated, abandoned. It looked to us like a couple of families might be coming back to build uh, summer cottages or, or whatever. A beautiful, beautiful, very secluded uh, uh, place. Um, that's the remains of the church. That's all that's left. And of course, the skipper had to have his picture taken with the boat in Ireland's eye just to prove I was there. More cod, all the time cod. What do you do with cod? The last stop before St. John um, was a place I wouldn't normally have gone to, but a paralegal in my law office uh, traced her mother's ancestry back to this place called Ochre Pit Cove. Uh, it really was an ochre pit of uh, red clay that they use for all kinds of stuff. Uh, her name was Half Yard, and she asked me to go to the cemetery if we stopped here and see if we could find some half yards, which we did. But when we pulled into the dock, first I asked, uh, I asked the first person to show up if there were any half yards around. Well, there's the keeper of the half yard ge uh, gene gene genealogy. Um, and so we spent a delightful hour or so uh, learning about the Half Yard family and what had happened over the years in Ochre Pit Cove. Here we're headed down around Cape St. Francis, which is the last Cape you round before coming into uh, St. John, which is a busy, bustling city, um, aided immeasurably by the oil and gas business going on here. This big building up here is their brand new museum called The Rooms. And these buildings like that, in the cod fishing days, there were little shacks along the shore called The Rooms that looked like this. And everybody had one and they were known as The Rooms. When you enter the museum, you go up a great big wide stairway uh, and at the top of it, this huge painting of Al Capone. The Newfoundlanders love Al Capone. He was the savior for quite a while because St. John's was his transit point for bringing in the, the booze from Europe, the, the bootleg booze from Europe and shipping it 
in uh, on to the states from here. There is a, a, a marina-like facility in, in St. John's, but it has no power, no water. Um, and so we preferred to be down in the commercial area where we had both. And we climbed the hill, Ad Admiralty Hill, so-called, which is where the British defended the place, um, looking down over the city. You can see it's quite, a, quite extensive. It's built on, on a tilt. And then there's a picture taken from the cockpit, a sunset picture with Ad Admiralty Hill up behind you there. Here I had a crew change. I lost Peter Murray and brought on another friend and we went down around the Avalon Peninsula. This is Cape Race here, around up through here, uh, across um, uh, Placentia Bay to Buren, and then out to the French islands, St. Pierre and Miquelon, um, where I've been before and wanted to look again. And then because we had a hurricane coming that we had to tie up somewhere, we went over into Fortune uh, to weather out the hurricane. David Platt, a longtime sailing companion. South uh, of St. John's on the Avalon Peninsula <clears throat> is a place called the Witless Ecological Preserve. And it is the home of more seabirds than you will ever see anywhere in your life. Um, lots of other animals, whales, seals, you name it. Um, this buzzing bunch of things here, thousands and thousands of them are puffins. They're all puffins, believe it or not. And they swarm around you like, uh, like mosquitoes. Seabirds of all kinds nestled in the, in the tundra and, uh, and in the rat rocks, egrets, um, herons, you name it. This is Cape Race, the much feared Cape Race. Um, which has been written about and lamented uh, so much. We managed to get down here on a glorious day. There wasn't much wind. Uh, we were going to head along the south coast for a little while. And so we turned the corner and within a few minutes, <laughs> there it is. Uh, and you're beating hard into it, uh, trying to get to your next stop. You can see the fender board here, uh, one of two that we carried. This is a little town um, called St. Brides on the uh, east side of the Placentia Bay. Um, this is very typical of the south coast. It's kind of sad, nothing much happening. Um, and uh, uh, this is the norm rather than what you saw around the other side of St. St. John's. Lovely sail across uh, uh, Placentia Bay to the little town of Buren. A uh, well, reasonably prosperous place, uh, a lot of summer folk here, um, and a few fishing, uh, summer fishing, most, mostly. We were, uh, when we pulled in, we uh, met up with these folks almost immediately. It's um, Merle and Diane, um, and they said, come on with us, we'll show, show you around. And they took us around, they took us to a, a, a music festival that evening, and we had dinner together at a, a local, uh, little local rest, restaurant. Um, and then the next morning, I asked if I could see the, uh, the, the church. There's a beautiful church here, and he was a deacon of it. Um, and so we went over there to have a look, and lo and behold, another beautiful little organ that I could get my hands on. This one at least had an electric blower, uh, so I could uh, play it to my heart's content and not wear people out. Right across from the church was this home house, um, anxiously for sale, and we were... Uh, asked uh, repeatedly if we wouldn't be willing to make an offer on it. And I'm um, sorry, but not gonna do that. So then after a couple more nights uh, poking our way along, uh, we went to Saint, uh, Saint Pierre. This is your now in France. Um, uh, I had called ahead, we, we got there on a Friday night and I called ahead trying to make a reservation in one of the uh, three or four really good restaurants there every single one was crammed and couldn't take us. We, we had a nice dinner at, at some, some place, but here you can get great French baguettes and croissants. They fly in the dough um, several times a week, uh, believe it or not. Um, so the uh, French administration, which largely comes from Paris and around, uh, can feel that they have their, uh, their appropriate uh, 
treat, treatment of uh, pastries and, and, and good food. Um, unfortunately, we had, a, this was the year, the summer of Hurricane Bill that came up the East Coast and did a certain amount of damage. And it, it was forecast that the eye of Bill would go right over this area here. So we, we left and went back to um, a fishing port I'd been in before um, on the south coast. This is Fortune. And you can see we're pretty well trussed up here. Uh, the eye of the storm did go over us that night. Um, and, uh, but it wasn't, it wasn't horrific and, and we, we weathered it out just fine. And then it was time to leave um, Newfoundland, unfortunately. And my original plan was, was to sail right down to um, here to Liscombe, uh, where I'd have a, a final crew change. Um, but as luck would have it, we got our next uh, and unforecasted gale as we were right about out in here. Um, the wind came right out of the southwest and blew you know, 35 to 45 for uh, 24 hours or so. And, and uh, so we had to alter course uh, and wind up in, um, in Lewisburg uh, at the top of Cape Breton there. You all know the phrase, um, red sky in the morning. Well, there it was, and we were treated accordingly. Uh, we got to Lewisburg, everything had to be dried out um, and because we'd taken quite a shellacking um, on the way over. But Lewisburg has two things that are of great interest. They have a, um, exact replica of Shakespeare's, Shakespeare's theater that they do a lot of uh, really nice uh, shows in. And they have this fort, which has been rebuilt. It was originally started by the British and then added onto significantly by the French. And then the British took it back and then it fell into disrepair and now it's completely rebuilt. And they do all kinds of reenactments um, every day. And they shoot off their big cannons with a big bunch of hoorah and, uh, noise and and uh, and uh, smoke. Um, it's, it's it's quite a, an interesting place to visit. Two more crew at this point. Um, I lost David Platt and had Scott Tees, an old sailing friend and a, a very very seasoned sailor himself, and his wife Pam, uh, join us for the ride down Nova Scotia. This is the little marina in Canso that I said we sat out our first gale. Um, it was quite a different scene then. Uh, working our way down the coast to Liscombe, where I would we would uh, drop off um, the two Pams, and I would take on one more person. And <clears throat> this is leaving uh, Liscombe. Uh, we sat out another uh, Hurricane Danny. was uh, was not much of a show, but we had to stay here while that blew itself through too. Uh, this is uh, sailing out, uh, really powering out in the sunset for the 400 mile nonstop ride back to Portland. Uh, my new crew, uh, Erno Bonebacher, has a very fine chef underway. Um, and he uh, made the end of our trip <laughs> quite a culinary delight and uh, uh, ex experience. And so on September 3, we were back in Portland, Maine, uh, 3,000 miles and 11 weeks later. Um, I'll put that one back up because it's my favorite slide. Uh, that's the end of the of the trip, and I'm happy to answer questions if there are any. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Uh, and everyone should know that Peter has spoken twice. He is so exceptional in that he is uh, one of the few people in the world that has actually cruised on a boat to Antarctica and uh, so astounded for that, that journey. He did that for his, was it your 70th birthday, Peter? 70th birthday treat, yes. That was so astounding. I just was so pleased. He spoke of it at St. Petersburg and uh, it was just so great. And uh, he's a, a, a very active member in the Ocean Cruising Club as well as an accomplished cruiser and we really appreciate your gracing the seven seas cruising association with such a great 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 presentation and it's so wonderful to watch this and not have to worry about your anchor dragging in the middle of the night in a blow 
<laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yes. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate your presentation right. and your work. And Thank you me. can turn off. Uh, well, I don't know. I have not seen any questions come. Your your talk has been so um, so excellent. Let me look real quick and make sure that we don't have. Uh, what was the date? That was a couple, uh, one of the questions that someone had. Oh, uh, we left Portland, um, Maine, on June 13, 2009, and we returned on September 3 of that year. Wow. Eleven weeks later. We'd love that. We once owned a uh, sailboat that was made by a bridge and steel construction company in Mahone Bay, and we've always wanted to be there at one time, but have never made the trip. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate right. it. Glad you to do have, it. A, have a great weekend. Thank you for making you our event so wonderful. Thank you all. Thanks, Ed. Take care. Thanks. And at this time, we'll, we'll uh, transition. Please stand by. Uh, we're next. Yeah, you, uh, Peter, you can turn off your camera and turn off your uh, uh, audio or your video also because uh, that's not necessary. And we're going to have next, we're going to have Bill Cullen. Bill writes for Sail Magazine and other magazines and is an accomplished world sailor and has done just a super job. He has spoken at events I've been to and has come up with so many, many things that are so wonderful. Uh, he should be an inventor. I guess he is. I had an uncle that uh, that actually is the person that invented steel wool. So I appreciate people that are inventive. Uh, so if you would, uh, 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 yeah, Bill Cullen, I'm sorry. Uh, anyway, we'd really, really like you to uh, uh, activate your microphone and uh, start your recording here now if we can. I guess I need to turn off my other recording. We're switching here. And we're sorry, we're kind of like a one-handed, uh, wallpaper hanger and bill is getting ready here stand by one yes and just a second bill q options that's not that we're trying to uh, stop recording so we can start yours and have a separate recording that will work well oh, i think then Stop recording. There we go.